This is The Mask of the Red Death by Edgar Allan Poe. Um, you'll note from the background here that there is a focus on the Black Plague here, the bubonic plague. Obviously not a historical account, but uh, drawing from that historical piece in order to make a point. <clears throat> the Red Death had long devastated the country. No pestilence had ever been so fatal or so hideous. Blood was its avatar and its seal the redness and horror of blood. So if we notice in this sentence, it both begins with and ends with the same sentence. And so the fact that we have focused on red death um, and then blood, blood, we're getting serious red and blood as a focus in this particular paragraph. There were sharp pains and sudden dizziness and then profuse bleeding of the pores with dissolution. If we take this word dissolution as a noun and turn it into a verb, that gives us dissolve, um, which gives us even kind of more ickiness to this. The scarlet stains upon the body and especially upon the face of the victim were the pest ban, which shut him out from the aid and sympathy of his fellow men. So again, we've got this idea of scarlet. Uh, and then we also have something on the face of the victim, um, which might make us think of a mask. And the whole seizure progress and termination of the disease were the incidents of a half an hour. So we've got speed, we've got red and blood, so we might be feeling some, uh, he's creating some fear, some uneasiness, uh, some uh, all, all kinds of kind of negative feelings here, although it's still a little bit removed. But the Prince Prospero was happy and dauntless and sagacious. So we've got a major tone shift here uh, where it's indicated by the word but, but then we've got Prince Prospero, happy, dauntless, sagacious, all positive words after all of the negative in the previous paragraph. And so we've got a serious contrast to what Prince Prospero is as a human and this particular disease. Um, happy, dauntless means fearless, sagacious means wise, um, and we can also infer that, that maybe he's got uh, a bit of prosperity here by his name. When his dominions were half depopulated, he summoned to his pre presence a thousand hale and light-hearted friends from among the knights and dames of his court. I'm going to circle a couple of the characteristics of the people that he is uh, inviting in here. Um, hale means healthy, so obviously he's not inviting in um, people who already have the red death, uh, but they also have to be highborn, they have to be light-hearted, they have to be happy. Um, so he summoned to his presence these thousand hale and light-hearted friends from among the knights and dames of his court. <clears throat> and with these, retired to the deep seclusion of one of his castellated abbeys. You'll see a definition for a castellated abbey over here. This was an extensive and magnificent structure, the creation of the prince's own eccentric and august taste. So we've got this idea of eccentricity and august taste. Um, so we know that he's a little bit odd, um, that he's out of the ordinary here. Um, and august means that he likes fancy things. A strong and lofty wall girdled it in. The wall had gates of iron. The courtiers, having entered, brought furnaces and massy, ha massy hammers and welded the bolts. They resolved to leave neither means neither of ingress or egress to the sudden impulses of despair or, or of frenzy from within. So you'll notice we've got a three sentences in a row that are dealing with these gates and these um, walls to keep things, in theory, our logical minds would say to keep things out. Um, which is here, like nothing can get in, nobody can come in in order to bring in the Red Death. But we also have that there's no way out. So if you have a sudden impulse of despair or frenzy, you can't get out. And that's really, mo there's more focus on that in this sentence than keeping things out, because we have more discussion of it. So maybe a counterintuitive thought there. The abbey was amply provisioned. With such precautions, the courtiers might bid defiance to contagion. So we do have the goal here, right? Um, is all of these happy rich people are trying to avoid the, uh, the plague. 
the external world could take care of itself. I'm going to circle this because essentially this is a statement of um, a major conflict here is, the, is he is leaving the outside world to fend for itself. And then we think about if we are um, alluding to the 14th century medieval England, then we're, we're looking at a feudal system. And we're looking at what a prince's uh, responsibility is, a prince or a duke's responsibility. And there is a symbiotic relationship between the two. And so he is supposed to take care of the people outside. So he is relinquishing his duty. Um, he is not doing what he, uh, whoops, sorry, relinquishing duty. He is not doing what he is, in theory, required by society to do by leaving the rest of the world to fend for itself. In the meantime, it was folly to grieve or to think. The prince had provided all the appliances of pleasure. So we've got this focus on um, happiness and um, not grieving, not thinking. Um, so we've got kind of bad stuff, leave it outside, good stuff, happiness come in. There were buffoons, there were improvisatory, there were ballet dancers, there were musicians, there was beauty, there was wine. We have here the repetition of the phrase, there were, over and over in this sentence, um, and then there was, there was. This is what we call anaphora, which is the anaphora, the repetition of a word or a phrase. And what it does is it highlights the things that were there, not necessarily the specifics, the buffoons and the um, and uh, and stuff like that, kind of fade to the background, but instead just kind of piles up how many things there are um, that are fantastic here. Um, you'll notice also that beauty is capitalized, which means that we've got a personification of beauty, which means that just all of the other things here are tangible things that you can touch and physically bring in. Beauty is an idea, but by capitalizing it and personifying it, it becomes almost tangible, something that we could invite in, um, and then becomes the characteristic of the things that come in. All of these and security were within. Without was the red death. So here we have a separation of sentences that like the wall separates security inside and the red death outside. So the sentence structure is reinforcing the ideas that are in this section. Toward the, toward the close of the fifth or sixth month of his seclusion, and while the pestilence raged most furiously abroad, that the, set, that the Prince Prospero entertained his thousand friends at a masked ball of most unusual magnificence. And so since we've already been told of some really fancy and magnificent things above, we're recognizing that this is ex even in excess of that um, for this particular ball. And we also notice the, uh, the time that has passed, that we've got five or six months in, and everything so far has been going well. It was a voluptuous scene, that masquerade. But first, let me tell you the rooms in which it was held. So now we're going to get setting. Um, if you can read through this section twice, and the first time just try to um, imagine and visualize this particular section, I'm going to do a little bit of pulling in some outside sources here, some, some allusions that you might not be aware of in order to highlight the things that you would not notice on a first reading that you might get a feeling for um, that I'm going to bring in those outside sources and kind of talk through them in a way that I wouldn't necessarily in the first time that I read this. There were seven um, and so when we think of the word seven, um, we have seven is kind of one of those magic word, magic numbers. We've got deadly sins. We've got the, um, we've got de seven deadly sins. We've got seven um, uh, virtues as well to counter that. We've got seven days of the week. Seven is one of those words. It's a lucky number. Um, and one that you might not be aware of is the seven stages of man. Oh, my pen's not working. Um, seven stages or ages of man. 
Um, and there we can refer to Shakespeare, um, and I'm going to blank on exactly where it comes from right now, um, but we'll pull that up later if you, if you Google Seven Stages of Man Shakespeare. It's going to pull up um, a monologue from one of his plays um, where he goes through from birth to death um, you know, you're very young and then you're strong and then, um, and then you get weak, or then you're wise, then you're weak. And so this is really the illusion that we are focused on through here with this seven. So there were seven rooms, an imperial suite. In many palaces, however, such suites form a long and straight vista. Folding the, sli- the door, folding doors slide back nearly to the wall on walls on either hand so that the view of the whole extent is scarcely impeded. So we're going to imagine a room where, um, just like in a ballroom, in theory, all of these different rooms could be closed off. Here, the case was very different. So it's not that. Um, I would challenge you to try to draw this in your margins or on another sheet of paper. I have never been successful, Um, but please try to imagine. Uh, as may have been expected from the Duke's love of the bazaar. So again, we're reinforcing... Oh, my pen is not happy right now. Um, just a second. Um, so I'm going to circle bazaar, even though it's not going to work. Um, so that reinforces that idea of eccentricity that existed earlier. The apartments so were so irregularly disposed that the vision embraced but little more at a than one at a time. So there, if we think back to the seven stages of man over here, um, we are considering that from one stage to another, you can't see when you are a young person, when and how adulthood really looks. You can imagine it, but it's, it's not going to be how you see it to be, how it actually is going to end up. There were sharp turns at every 20 or 30 yards, and at each turn, a novel effect. So again, those stages of, uh, of, of humanity um, shifting. When you are you know, a, school, a school child, it's very, very different from when you are, um, say, in your middle ages. To the right and left, in the middle of each wall, a tall and narrow Gothic window looked out upon the closed corridor that pursued the windings of the suite. So here we're picturing outside of each of these rooms, which are not straight like this, um, a stained glass window that breaks in at each one with a corridor running along the side of these. The windows were of stained glass whose color varied in accordance with the prevailing hue of the decorations into the chamber in the chamber into which it opens. So then we're going to get a little bit more information about that. I'm going to see if this works now. Um, that at the eastern extremity, nope, not, oh, there we go, eastern extremity was hung, for example, in blue, and vividly blue were its windows. So we've got this, uh, that the, the windows, oh, this is not making me happy, um, and the, um, and the, the casements are the same, so we're starting at the east to west. And so if we think about the sun rising in the east and setting in the west, we get another kind of consideration of how these rooms are set out and how that might go along with these seven stages where um, it starts at the beginning of life, um, the life of the sun, and ends at the um, setting of the sun, so east to west. So we start with blue. The colors we can certainly consider individually as well, um, but for now I'm just going to let you use your imagination for what that might mean. Blue might be kind of that innocence of youth. For a long time, we didn't have pink and blue for babies, um, but, uh, but blue is kind of that, uh, that soft, innocent color. The second chamber was purple, and its ornaments, in, uh, as were its ornaments and tapestries. And here, the panes were uh, purple. The third was green throughout, and so were the ca- casements. The fourth was furnished and lighted with orange, the fifth with white, the sixth with violet. The seventh apartment was closely shrouded in black velvet tapestries that hung over all over the ceiling and down the walls, falling in heavy folds upon the carpet in, of the same material and hue. So here we're imagining not just part of the room, but black velvet that kind of absorbs all light on ceiling, floor, and walls. 
but but in this chamber so again we've got that word but um, and I don't think I'm going to be able to get my pen to work I'm going to try it again um, but the uh, but gives us again a um, a shift and something to focus on but in this chamber only the color of the windows failed to correspond with the decorations so for six of the seven it's exactly the same blue blue orange orange now here it's different the panes here were scarlet a deep blood color so i'll change my color of my pen if my pen is going to work um, we're going back to that first paragraph with that scarlet and red, um, reminding us of the red death. Now, in no one of the seven apartments were there any lamp or candelabrum amid the profusion of golden ornaments that lay scattered to and fro or depended from the roof. There was no light of any kind emanated, emanating from lamp or candle within the suite of chambers. So reinforcement, no light inside the rooms but and there again that word but that tells us about a shift in the corridors uh, that followed the suite there stood opposite to each window a heavy tripod bearing a brazier of fire that projected its rays through the tinted glass and so glaringly illuminated the room and thus were produced a multitude of gaudy and fantastic appearances so here all of the other rooms, we don't get how it feels, but in this final room, we get a feeling, this black, um, which isn't a color at all, actually, um, but rather a shade, with this gaudy and fantastic, terrible um, kind of feeling that it's created with the red, blood red uh, paints. But in the Western, or, uh, I guess that's all of them, I'm sorry. But again, in the Western or Black Chamber, the firelight that streamed upon the dark hangings through the blood-tinted panes again was, uh, sorry, was gaudy in the, ghastly in the extreme and, so, and produced so wild a look upon the countenances of those who entered that there were few of the company bold enough to set foot within its precincts at all. So we see avoidance. We see people not wanting to go into the apartment and into this particular room because it feels wrong. Instead of just gaudy and weird, instead we have the word ghastly, um, where things just aren't, um, are things that you would want to avoid. It was in this apartment also that there stood upon the western wall, so again that west where the sun sets, was a gigantic clock of ebony. And ebony again is a word for black. Um, so we've got black walls, black curtains, black tapestries, black carpet, um, and then a black clock. Its pendulum swung to and fro with a dull, heavy, and monotonous clang. And when the minute hand made the circuit of the face and the hour was to be stricken, it came from the, there came from the brazen lungs of the clock a sound which was clear and loud and deep and exceedingly musical, but of so peculiar a note and emphasis that at the lapse of each hour, the musicians of the orchestra were constrained to pause momentarily in their performance, to hearken to the sound. And thus the waltzer, waltzers waltzers perforce ceased their evolutions and there was a brief disconcert of the whole gay company and while the chimes of the clock yet rang it was observed that the giddiest turned pale and the more aged and sedate passed their hands over their uh, over their brows as if in confused reverie or meditation Go back and look at how long that sentence was. We've got a lot of imagery there. We've got focus on words, hour, minute, seconds. Um, we have the lungs of the clock giving it some personification there. And we are held in that sentence for a long, uncomfortable time that reinforces the discomfort of the people who are also noting um, this clock and the time that's passing and all the sudden there is a focus on time. So we had potentially with the East and West a focus on days. We've got, you know, kind of the windings of the suite focusing us on progress. And here we've got a focus specifically on time, hours and minutes and seconds. But, so again, that word but reinforcing uh, um, kind of shifts in ideas and feeling. And I am not gonna get my pen to work. 
When the echoes had fully ceased, a light laughter at once pervaded the assembly. So a light laughter. So we've got all of those things before um, that were supposed to be lighthearted, but we're coming back to it a little bit. Uh, at once pervaded the assembly. The musicians looked at each other and smiled as if at their own nervousness and folly and made whispering vows each to the other that the next chiming of the clock should produce in them no similar emotion. So they're kind of, uh, we're, we're not supposed to think or grieve. And so here they're reminding themselves that no, 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 we're not supposed to do that. And then, after the lapse of 60 minutes, which embrace a 3,600 seconds of t the time that flies, there came yet another chiming of the clock, and then were the same disconcert and tremulousness and meditation as before. So we're back to those negative words again, um, the uh, disconcert and tremulousness and meditation. Um, and we also have this focus on time here. I'm going to try to just use my finger and it's not going to work. Um, we've got seconds in that parenthetical and again holding us in time and reminding us how long that hour takes but that time kind of gets condensed and we forget about it when this chiming happens again. But in spite of these things, again that word but, it was a gay and magnificent revel. So again, a tone shift. All of that was kind of pervasive and negative and feeling like things are closing in. This clock makes everybody feel bad, but the rest of the party is great. The tastes of the Duke were peculiar. So again, we have eccentric, we had bizarre, now we've got peculiar. Um, so again, strange. He had a fine eye for colors and effects. Hence those rooms that, uh, that are gaudy in the extreme um, and just kind of feel weird. He disregarded the de decora of mere fashion. His plans were bold and fiery and his conception glowed with barbaric luster. So again, we've got glow and luster, bold and fiery, all having to do with light. Um, so kind of reminding us of those fires outside of the rooms that are glowing in a weird way into the rooms. So we've got the idea of light and dark playing as a motif, we might say, throughout. It's something that just kind of gets reinforced throughout. Um, there, he, I'm uh, sorry, there, uh, there are some who would have thought him mad. His followers felt that he was not. So again, we've got this idea of outside versus inside. Um, other people might think that he was a little bit crazy, but the people who were inside do not believe that. It was necessary to hear and to touch, uh, see and touch him to be sure that he was not. So here, the idea of reality and being able to physically touch. He had directed, in great part, the movable establishments of the seven chambers upon occasion of this great fete, which is a party. And it was his own guidance and taste which had given ch character to the masqueraders. Be sure they were grotesque. So that word grotesque, um, again, makes us think that like people are going to react, react to them. Um, grotesque, not necessarily meaning gross, but rather something that makes us feel a little bit weird there. There were, there was, there were much glare and glitter and piquancy and phantasm, much of what has been seen since in Hernani. And so here we get this idea of an allusion um, to a very um, specific play that not one of Victor Hugo's that has lasted quite as long, um, but we can see how this allusion, if we had seen that play, would give us a lot of insight into what this party might look like. There were arabesque figures with unsuited limbs and appointments. There were del uh, deli uh, I'm sorry, delirious fancies, such as the madman fashions. There was much of the beautiful, much of the wanton, much of the bizarre, and something of the terrible, and not a little of that which might have excited disgust. So we've got a little bit of a shift, and this we've got lots of things that amaze, but there's always this element of it might be a little too far, this disgust, this um, bizarre, this grotesque. Um, we do have that repetition of there were and there was a little bit there um, that reinforces. 
To and fro in the seven chambers, they're stalked, in fact, a multitude of dreams. And that stalked is kind of a negative word that, again, gives us a little bit of unease. And these, the dreams, writhed in and about, taking hue from the rooms and causing wild music of the orchestra to seem as the echo of their steps. And anon, there strikes the ebony clock, which stands in the hall of velvet. And so we've got a, sh a shift again where, where, we're, uh, where our attention is brought back to that clock. A short sentence. The dreams are stiff frozen as they stand. But the echoes of the chime die away. They have ignore, endured but an instant. And a light, half-subdued laughter floats after them as they depart. So again, we've got this quick shift to everything feeling bad. But then we laugh it off and we go back to the party. And now again, the music swells and the dreams live. And notice that we've got this focus on dreams also. Um, and uh, we've seen that a bunch throughout here, that things aren't quite solid. Um, so they live and writhe to and fro more merrily than ever, taking cue from the many tinted windows through which stream the rays of the tripods. But to the chamber which lies most westerly of the seven, that's the black and scarlet one, there are now none of the maskers who venture, for the night is waning away, and there flows a ruddier light through the blood-colored panes, and the blackness of the sable drapery, that's black, appalls, and to him whose foot falls upon the sable carpet, there comes, uh, there comes from near the clock of ebony a muffled peal more solemnly emphatic than any which reaches their ears who indulge in the in the more remote galleries of the other apartments. So the closer you get to this black room, the crummier it feels. You might notice that we had a shift in verb tense here from the were um, in the beginning of this paragraph until here. This is where we have a shift to the present tense, where we are now we are, uh, that forces the reader to also be in the moment with the people who are there, and it makes it more urgent. Um, and we are experiencing along with them this, uh, this feeling of being uncomfortable. And then we go back to the past tense, uh, which kind of gives us a little bit more removal, and we'll be able to... Um, think a little bit more objectively about this than that discomfort that we should have felt through here. But these other apartments were densely crowded, and in them beat feverishly the heart of life. Really important here if we're thinking about time and the seven stages of man. Um, we have the heart of life here that we might also be thinking about death. And the revel went whirlingly on, until at length there commenced the sounding of midnight upon the clock. So we've got the passage of time concretely here to a specific time now. And if we're thinking about sunrise, sunset, if we're thinking about east, west, if we're thinking about the passage of time, midnight is a key one there. And then the music ceased, as I have told. And the evolutions of the waltzes were now quieted, and there was an uneasy cessation of all things as before. But now there were twelve strokes to be sounded by the bell of the clock, which means that it takes longer, right? And it happened, perhaps, that more of, the, uh, more of thought crept with more of time into the meditations of the thoughtful among those who reveled. And thus, too, it happened, perhaps, that the last echoes of the last chime had sunk utterly into silence. There were many individuals in the crowd who had found leisure to become aware of the presence of a masked figure, which had arrested the attention of no single individual before. So now we have a masked figure. We have a new character um, that now they can notice because of the time that has passed uh, for the 12 chimings of the clock. And the rumor of this new presence, having spread itself whisperingly around, there arose at length from the company a buzz or, or murmur, expressive, expressive of disapprobation and surprise, and then finally of terror, of horror, and of disgust. So first disapproval, and then these terrible words, the terror, the horror, and the disgust. In an assembly of phantasms such as I have 
painted, it may well be supposed that no ordinary appearance could have excited such a sen such sensation. In truth, the masquerade license of the night was nearly unlimited, but the figure in question had out-Heroded Herod and gone beyond the bounds of even the prince's indefinite decorum. So here we know how bizarre and weird he is and how well all of this stuff is going, but here this person has gone too far. Um, we do have an allusion to King Herod, um, which, uh, which you'll note in the side note. There are chords in the hearts, so again, we, that idea of hearts again, of the most reckless, which cannot be touched without emotion, even with the utterly lost, to whom life and death are equally jests. And so here we might consider that the, those are the people at the party. They had to be lighthearted. They have to pretend that all of this death outside doesn't exist. There, matters, uh, there are matters which no jest can be made. The whole company, indeed, seemed now to be to, now deeply to feel that uh, that in the costume and bearing of the stranger, neither wit nor propriety existed. The figure was tall and gaunt and shrouded from head to foot with the habiliments of the grave, so he's dressed as if he has been buried. The mask, so we've got mask now, just like the mask of the Red Death, which concealed the visage, his face was made so nearly to resemble the countenance of a stiffened corpse that the closest scrutiny must have had difficulty in discerning the cheat. And yet all this might have been endured, if not approved, by the mad revelers around. But the mummer had gone so far to assume the type of the red death, had gone so far as to assume the type of the red death. Okay, so again, we're like, whoa, maybe that's too far, dressing up as if you've died of this particular disease that we're trying to avoid. His vesture was dabbled in blood, and his broad brow, with the features of his face, was besprinkled with the scarlet horror. And so again, we've got this focus on blood and scarlet. When the eyes of Prince Prospero fell upon the spectral image, so the image like a ghost spectral, which with a slow and solemn movement, as if more fully to sustain its role, stalked to and fro among the waltzers. So this idea of a role, um, that he's playing a part, um, is important there. I'm sorry. He was seen to be convulsed in the first moment with a strong shudder, either of terror or distaste, but in the next, his brow reddened with rage. So here, even Prince Prospero is feeling terror or distaste, but then he shifts to anger. Um, and that's really important that he is now angry, not freaking out, but angry that this has existed. Who dares, he demanded hoarsely of the courtiers who stood near him, who dares insult us with this blasphemous mockery? Seize him and unmask him that we may know whom we have, have to hang at sun, sunrise from the battlements. So he's taking charge. Um, he is going to take care of this and fix it. Um, so his authority is coming out here. It was in the eastern or blue chamber in which stood the Prince Pro Prospero as he uttered these words. So again, that sunrise area um, or blue, which is the first stage of uh, humanity, of stage of life. They rang throughout the seven rooms loudly and clearly, for the prince was a bold and robust man, and the music had become hushed at the waving of his hand. So he's orchestrating now the orchestra, and so we've got the music, which was representing kind of the lightheartedness, now stopping. So now things are serious. It was in the blue room, so we've got a repetition of it was in the blue room there. Um, where stood the prince, with a group of pale courtiers by his side. At first, as he spoke, there was a slight rushing movement of his group in the direction of the intruder, because they're quick to follow, who at the moment were also near at hand, and now, with deliberate and stately step, made closer approach to the speaker. But from a certain nameless awe which, uh, with which the mad assumptions of the mummer had inspired in the whole party, there... Oh, just a second, let me find it. It's not going to go. There were found none who, who put forth his hand to seize him. So again, that fear is holding everybody back. So that, unimpeded, he passed within a yard of the prince's person. 
So even the prince is not reaching out to grab him here. He's uh, inspiring this fear. And while the vast assembly, as if with one impulse, shrank from the centers of the room to the walls, he made his way uninterruptedly, but with the same solemn and measured step. So here we've got this idea of solemn and measured that's come through again, kind of like time passing again, those, uh, the, um, the second hand or the chiming of the clock, that it's measured out and you've only got so many which had distinguished him from the first, through the blue chamber to the purple, through the purple to the green, through the green to the orange, through again to the white, and even thence to the violet, ere a decided movement had been made to arrest him. It was then, however, that the Prince Prospero, maddening with rage and the shame of his own momentary cowardice, rushed hurriedly through the six chambers, while, uh, while none followed him on account of the deadly terror that had seized upon all. So he's the only one, and again, his rage is what is fueling this. He's angry at this person dressed up as death, whereas everybody else is frozen by fear or terror. He bore aloft a drawn dagger, okay, so a small uh, knife or sword, that and had approached in rapid impetuosity, okay, so without thinking, impetuous, to within three or four feet of the retreating figure, when the latter, having attained the extremity of the velvet apartment, so now we're in the black room, right? We've gone through the seven stages of life, turned suddenly and confront, confronted his pursuing. So we have Prince Prospero literally running after death, chasing death uh, with a dagger as if to kill him. There was a sharp cry, and the dagger dropped gleaming upon the sable carpet, upon which instantly afterwards fell prostrate in death the Prince Prospero, so unsuccessful. Then, summoning the wild courage of despair, a throng, so here it's, it's a different type of courage, not anger, but rather of despair, um, kind of giving up on things. A throng of revelers at once threw themselves into the black apartment, and seizing the mummer, whose tall figure stood erect and motionless within the shadow of the ebony clock, gasped at the unutterable horror at finding the grave cerements and corpse-like mask, which they had handled with so violent uh, rudeness, untenanted by any tangible form. So there's nothing inside. So here we have what we would call anthropomorphism. Um, so morphism, where we have death, not just personified, but rather as a character. Um, it goes beyond he could walk um, and exist there and kill everybody um, and uh, take those stately steps, but not just one thing like having brazen lungs, having created a character out of him, but turns out it's empty. And now was acknowledged the presence of the Red Death, so the red death there being the actual illness being shown as a physical character, as a physical presence there. He had come like a thief in the night and one by one dropped the revelers in the blood, blood bedewed halls of their revel and died each in, a, in the despairing posture of his fall. And the life of the ebony clock went out with the last of the gay, uh, with the last of the gay. And the flames of the tripods expired, and darkness and decay and the red death held illimitable dominion over all. So here we have um, all of those markers of time stopping. Um, so there we've got death, right? Um, so all of them die as the same time as the clock ends, the fire goes out. So all of those things, those imagery of light and dark and colors have all come together as this end.